Good morning. It's great to be here. I was thinking about uh, coming here today, and I assume that often when you have guest speakers, especially people who haven't been to Cedarville, that one of the things they often say is, I'm honored to be here, and I am. And I'm sure that one of the other things they say is how great you have it to be at a place like Cedarville, because Cedarville is a special place, and it is. But I was also just thinking about chapel, and I went to a Christian college and went to uh, probably as many chapels as many of you have, and I was trying to think back and say, can I remember any of the content that actually was taught to me in chapel? And the answer to that question was almost none. I I can remember that there were some great chapels, there were some boring chapels, there were some that I loved. Um, But here's what I know and what I hope is happening for you, and that is I know that God used those chapels, those speakers, the word to instruct my life in many ways, and I know that God is doing that even if you don't remember all of the content or the names of the different people who come through. So I just want to take a moment and pray that God will work in these moments. Would you pray with me? Father, wherever each of us are coming from today, I pray that you would speak to us, that your word would instruct us. I pray that my words would reflect your word in content and in tone and in emphasis. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, here's the other thing I remember about chapel, and that is most of the people who came seemed really old to me at the time because I was obviously in my late teens, early 20s, and they'd get these 40-year-old guys and sometimes women who would come speak, and you'd just be like, that's old. And so I'm just going to lean into that for a moment here. And so where I live, um, our church is uh, diverse. It's got a couple different locations, but the, the spot where I live personally is fairly well off. And what that means is there's a lot of men who are my age who have done pretty well. They have money, they have time. And so a group of these guys came together and decided that what they wanted to do was they wanted to climb Mount Rainier. Now, Mount Rainier is the highest uh, non-technical climb in the United States. They invited me to come and be a part of this group. And the reason I say they had time and money is because it takes some time to do that. It takes a little money to do that. And so we climbed Mount Rainier a couple summers ago. But before we did that, what we did is we went and climbed a bunch of other mountains with big packs on our backs to try to prepare for the climb. So here's a picture, I think, of me climbing uh, one of these mountains uh, right there. And so this was the White Mountain, White Mountains in New Hampshire. And then here's the next picture, um, which has us at the summit. Now, here's what I remember about this moment. We get to the summit, we have walked with 40 pound backpacks. Some of the guys were fanatical about training for Rainier where you're gonna have these packs on your back and have to go up 14,000 feet. And so this was like six, 8,000 feet, I forget exactly, but, but, but it was brutal. And we got to the top and before uh, I had this picture taken with a couple of my friends, a couple guys who had driven to the top came out and the one guy had gone into the concession stand and he had a chili dog and he had flip-flops on. And he's walking out and he gets his picture taken in front of the summit sign with a chili dog in flip-flops. Now I just just had a moment where I was like, really? I just climbed this mountain with 40 pounds on my back. Now I tell you that because sometimes spiritually, what we can do is we can say, I have worked for something that somebody else hasn't worked for. And when we have that mindset, it actually underlines a little distaste for grace. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus tells a story. It's called the parable of the workers in the vineyard. In some of the titles above the text itself, let me read this text. It says, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for a day and sent them into the vineyard. So what would happen is a worker would go out and stand in the public square and when somebody wanted workers, they would go there, they would hire them. Usually early in the morning, they would work from sun up to sundown. So the landowner goes out and he says, I'm gonna give you a day's wage for a day's work. 
and people go to work and they're happy. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again at noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. And about five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. And he asked them, why are you standing here all day doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go into my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired going to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius, so a day's pay. So when those who were hired first came, they expected to receive more, but each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, and they said, you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the, in the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Do you see the workers who had worked all day object to grace? They have a distaste for the grace of the landowner to those who came later. Now, just to, to, to maybe drive this home a little more spiritually, there's a song that Sufjan Stevens wrote just a little while ago uh, called John Wayne Gacy Jr. If you are a fan of indie rock, you might know this song and Sufjan. And the song is about the life of John Wayne Gacy Jr. And it got me thinking a little bit about serial killers when I heard the song. And one of the most notorious serial killers in my years of kind of being around was a man named Jeffrey Dahmer. Maybe you have heard this story, but Jeffrey Dahmer lived in Wisconsin and around Chicago, and he would abduct young boys, and he would take them, he would abuse them, he would kill them, he would dismember them, and he was finally caught. And then he went to prison. And while he was in prison, the story is told that he came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. That he would go to the chapels and worship and some of the other inmates found that so distasteful that they beat him to death. Now here's why I bring up the serial killer. It's easy to say it's kind of annoying to have somebody eat chili dogs with flip-flops at the top of a mountain. But there's a little piece of me, if I'm honest, that doesn't want to be in a small group with Jeffrey Dahmer in heaven someday. Because I look at that and I say, really? He's going to have eternity? And if our, our theology is what we have always said, which is that it's not by works, but it's by grace, Jesus does for us what we can't do. What, what that means, and you've heard this, the, the idea of the deathbed conversion, that you and I do not earn any more grace by having been long in the Christian faith than somebody who comes at the last moment after a life of crime, even being a serial killer. and necessarily put ourselves in a different place. And notice what Jesus does here. When he comes to the, this man, verse 13, he says, but he answered one of them, am I being unfair to you, friend? And the word friend here is not the normal Greek word that's translated friend. Usually the word is philos, and, and here it's the word heter, and this, if I could give kind of a loose translation of this, is maybe more like him saying something along the lines of, am I being unfair to you, buddy? You see, philos was the word of kind of endearment. Heter was a word of general associate. It's the word that he used, Jesus used with Judas before he betrayed him. And so here he comes and he says, what are you talking about? I can do what I want. Jerry Bridges wrote something years ago that I think speaks directly to this kind of distaste for grace. Here's what he said. He said, my observation of Christendom 
is that most of us tend to base our relationship with God on our performance instead of on his grace. If we have performed well, whatever well is in our opinion, then we expect God to bless us. If we haven't done so well, then our expectations are reduced accordingly. In this sense, we live by works rather than by grace. We're saved by grace, but we're living by the sweat of our own performance. Then he continues a little later. Moreover, we are always challenging ourselves and one another to try harder. We seem to believe that success in the Christian life is basically up to us. Our commitment, our discipline, and our zeal with a little help from God along the way. And here's what Jerry Bridges was driving at. I think it's the same thing that Jesus is saying in this story. And that is he's saying that most of us base our sense of our relationship with God on our performance rather than his grace. And from this text, I think we can see a couple indicators that maybe, just maybe, we have a little distaste for grace. Maybe we're like me standing on that mountain with a guy with flip-flops and a chili dog and going, really? You get the same experience, I get the same picture, I worked for it. And here's the the first one, and that is, I'm just going to say sometimes we live with a sense of entitlement. And when I say a sense of entitlement, what I'm talking about is that what we do is we say, I've done all the right things, and since I've done all the right things, God should do something in a certain way that I feel is, is good for me in this world. Now, clearly the Bible speaks about rewards. I believe that blessing often follows obedience, but but what Jesus is driving at here is not to undermine those thoughts as much as he's saying, understand that as soon as you start to feel entitled, as soon as you start to say, I deserve more because I've performed better, that what you're doing is you're actually saying, I somehow have put God in my debt. I have somehow garnered his favor because of what I have done. And here's maybe some of the ways that this shows up in our world, your world. And that is whenever we start to say, God, I saved myself for marriage and I can't even get a date. Thanks, God. God, my family was really faithful at the church I grew up in. I know my parents gave They put other siblings through school. We even gave to the Jeremiah Chapel Fund. And now my dad lost his job. Thanks, God. You know, God, we served. I went to VBS in the basement of a church night after night for years. And now my mom is sick. Thanks, God. God, I went to Cedarville. I didn't go to Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan and drink away my college years. And now I know some guys and girls who did and they're getting great jobs and I don't seem to have any prospects. Thanks, God. Do do, do you hear the sense of entitlement that starts to come into our way of thinking? Where we start to say, because I've done everything the, the way that I think I should have, to the best of my ability, not saying I've, I've done it all, but because I've done that, therefore, what I start to think is that God somehow owes me. And I think what Jesus is doing in this passage very simply is he's countering this. Verse 13 again, he says, but he answered one of them and said, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Didn't you agree to this, he says. And what he's saying very simply is, I'm being fair to you, but your problem here is that you're starting to believe that because you've performed a certain way that I owe you more. Now, I've been around church a long time. I've been a pastor a long time. And I can tell you that one of the the biggest problems that happens for people spiritually is right at this point, and that is they'll say, I'll follow God, but they're actually not following God because they worship God and are grateful for the grace and the goodness of God in their lives. They follow God because they believe that on the other side of following God, there's something good. And as soon as something bad happens in their life, what they do is they start to say, I'm mad at God, I'm upset with God. Now, certainly, if you read the Psalms, there's room to say, God, I'm not sure about what you're doing. God, I'm not happy with the direction of things. 
I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is for some people, what they'll do is as soon as something doesn't go their way, they'll start to say, that is evidence that God is not in this. And they end up being somebody who shows a distaste for the grace of God because they're saying, I've earned it. I've made my whole way. Here's a second kind of indicator of perhaps a distaste for grace, and I would just say critical spirit. And that is, as soon as we start to look at other people and say, they didn't work as long as I did, they didn't do what I did, then what we're doing is we're exhibiting, again, a performance-based mindset when we approach God. And the way that this works generally in, in the culture, the Christian subculture, is that we start to look and we say, well, well, God prefers the kind of person, the kind of faith, the kind of life that I live more than the kind of faith that somebody else lives. Now, I'm, again, a local church pastor, so I care deeply about doctrinal purity, clarity, say, saying that the things that we believe really matter. But, but you know what my temptation is at this point? It's to look at other churches other pastors who believe things that are different that I frankly think are inaccurate and start to believe that somehow God likes me and the church that I pastor better than he likes other people and the churches that they attend. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying that, that your doctrine doesn't matter, but what I'm saying is it's really easy to look at other people on all kinds of levels and say, oh, that's what's wrong with them. That's what's wrong with that group. That's what's wrong with, with, with that kind of subset of people. And when we start to do that, what we're actually doing is we're saying God prefers me and my kind more than he prefers other people and their kind. And what's at the heart of this is comparison. And what's at the heart of comparison is generally either pride or insecurity. And here's what this means. This means when, when you or I look around and we say, the way that they're living their faith, the way that they're expressing their faith is less than ideal. I'm comparing. What I'm actually doing is I'm expressing my own pride my own insecurity, my own feeling of a need to somehow be validated through my performance rather than standing completely on God's grace. And as soon as I do that or you do that, what we're doing is we're comparing ourselves just like these workers and we're saying, I think I'm better, I deserve more because I did more. That's what we're doing. I heard a story once about a man who was notorious in a community for cheating on people and uh, kind of scamming people out of money and doing a whole bunch of things. And his brother was, was just as notorious in the town. And his brother died and he approached a pastor at a local church and he said, you know, I'd love to uh, have my brother have the funeral in your church. And he said, and I'll make a large donation to your church, but there's one condition and that is you have to say in the funeral that my brother was a saint. And the pastor thought about it and said, well, I'll do the funeral. And he knew this would be a conundrum because if he said that the man was a saint, everybody would know that he wasn't and that the pastor had somehow accommodated this in a, in a poor way. And so the day came for the funeral and the pastor's there and, and, and he starts off and he says, you know, the, this man lying before you, the deceased, was a cheater. He probably swindled many of you out of money. He ran around on his wife. He did this, he did that, and he went down a list of things that everybody knew. And then he said, but compared to his brother, this man's a saint. <laughs> so he got, I guess, uh, whatever he was looking for. But, but, but here's what, what happens sometimes, is we say, compared to those people. And as soon as we do that, we've moved from grace to performance. I mentioned earlier the Sufjan Stevens song about John Wayne Gacy Jr. The last two lines of the song say this, in my best behavior, I'm really just like him. Look beneath my floorboards for the secrets that I have hid. 
See, what Jesus, I believe, is doing in this story is he's not saying you as my followers are the all-day workers. What he's doing is he's saying you're actually the 11th hour worker too. And the way that, that, that we come to, to not live with a critical spirit or, or live with, with a sense of, of entitlement is to come back to the foundation of grace and see what Jesus does here. Verse 15, the, the first thing that he does is he says, don't I have a right to do what I want with my own money? And what you and I need to do if we're not going to have a distaste for grace is we need to say God is right to do whatever he wants and to be gracious to whom he wants to be gracious. And what that means is when I stand here and I say in, in just a moment of candor that I don't want to be in a small group with Jeffrey Dahmer in heaven, that, that what I'm doing is I'm saying I somehow think I'm better and that God has a right to be gracious to whom he wants to be gracious because I have some secrets hidden in my floorboards too. You see, if I don't get that, if you don't get that, what I will do is I will consistently return to the place of saying, I'm entitled, God, you owe me, or I'm critical because I'm comparing, and it's based on my pride. And it will lead, not just me, but any community of Christ followers to become followers of Christ in such a way that people within the broader community say, you're full of pride. You know, one of the great critiques of Christians today in our, in our culture is people like to say Christians are judgmental, they're hypocritical. And, and what they're generally saying when they say Christians are judgmental is they're saying you think you're better than everybody else. Now, sometimes that's unavoidable because sometimes people have that mindset and it has nothing to do with what somebody's done. But sometimes what they're saying is you're critical of everybody else, you're entitled, and you really do think you're better rather than understanding that the ground at the foot of the cross is level. So what we need to do is we need to come and say, I acknowledge that God is right to do as he sees fit. And then secondly, we need to acknowledge verse 15 that he has lavished grace on this. He says, or are you envious because I'm generous? And the implication here is that the owner did not necessarily need all of these workers. That when he went into the, to, to the market and he said, I, I can bring in a worker here late in the day, that, that he would bring in a worker and basically as he would bring in the worker, he would say, I'm bringing this worker in because I want to lavish, lavish this person with grace. And you see what is significant if we don't want to end up having a distaste for grace is that we actually consistently put ourselves back in a place where we say it's only the grace of God. It's only what Jesus Christ has done on the cross on my behalf that allows me to stand before God. It's not my performance. I heard a president of a different Christian college say that he believed that the school that he was at needed to have the gospel preached to it as much as any secular campus. And his point was this, and that is there's really two ways to run from God, to run from grace, to run from Jesus. One is rebellion, outright rebellion, just saying, I'm gonna live my own way, I'm gonna do my own thing. But the other is much more subtle and it's to use religion and it's to use faith as a way to say, I'm so good that I don't actually need grace, I don't actually need Jesus. Rather than savoring the work that God has done on your behalf, Brennan Manning put it like this. He said, it takes a profound conversion to accept that God is relentlessly tender and compassionate toward us, just as we are, not in spite of our sins and faults, for that would not be total acceptance, but with them. God does not condone or sanction evil, but he does not withhold love because of the evil that is in us. See, when so many people think about church and Christianity and 
Christian universities, what they think about is a group of people who say, we've got it together and you out there don't have it together. And sometimes that, that's legitimate because there's, there's a constant kind of battle around some of the moral center of, of some things, but, but what would be better is if they said the people that I know that are part of those institutions are people who see themselves as recipients of the grace of the goodness of God. And notice how Jesus ends this whole passage. He says, the first will be last and the last will be first, that familiar phrase. And what he's doing is he's simply in principle form saying, saying when you put yourself in a place of saying I'm the least, then God says, now I'll work in ways that transcend even your understanding. Will you pray with me? Father God, I pray that you would let your grace be so clear in my own heart and life that I wouldn't be tempted to rebellion, running from you saying I'm doing my own thing, or to religion saying I don't need because I've done. And Lord, I pray that for each person here that, that we would so experience your grace day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, that we wouldn't come to you demanding, that we wouldn't go to other people being critical, but instead we would go as recipients of your goodness and your grace as lavished on us in Jesus Christ. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.